Hi, it's Brian Rose from London Real, and thank you for joining us for a very special world premiere live stream of the movie Plandemic Indoctrination on the Digital Freedom Platform. As many of you know, on April 6th of 2020, we broadcast a conversation on London Real with David Icke that became the second largest YouTube live stream in the world that day, only behind that of the President of the United States, Donald Trump. With 65,000 concurrent viewers, nearly four times our previous live stream with Ike, this episode was expected to reach 40 million views, making it the largest video podcast in human history. Unfortunately, just 30 minutes later, the entire live stream episode was deleted and banned on YouTube with no explanation and no communication with us. We decided that this censorship was unacceptable and in direct conflict with our mission here at London Real, to create a mass scale transformation of humanity into a fully empowered, conscious and cooperative species. So we fought back and created the Digital Freedom Platform, a censorship free, independent broadcasting system that is of the people, by the people, for the people, and available exclusively on our website at freedomplatform.tv. This was only made possible thanks to the generous donations of over 35,000 people around the world we affectionately call the London Real Army. They donated their hard-earned money so we can broadcast important ideas in an unscripted, unedited, and uncensored manner and fight back against illegal censorship from these trillion-dollar technology companies. Our supporters are fighting with us on the front lines to protect our most basic and fundamental human right. That to freedom of speech. I might not agree with everything you have to say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. The Digital Freedom Platform has now broadcast game-changing interviews with thought leaders such as Dr. Rashid Buttar, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Dr. Judy Mikovits, Nobel Prize winner Professor Michael Levitt, Dr. Sherry Tenpenny, Professor Emeritus Noam Chomsky, Dr. Andrew Wakefield, Professor Dolores Cahill, General Robert Spaulding, Dr. Andrew Kaufman, and many, many more. These conversations were live streamed uncensored to millions of viewers, and we are extremely proud of what we have accomplished together so far. But we have only begun. As I've said before, we are not here to take part, we are here to take over. For anybody wanting to join us and become a founding member of the Digital Freedom Platform, you can visit freedomplatform.tv forward slash give to donate and fight with us on the front lines to protect our human rights. Today, I am very excited to be working with Mickey Willis, the director of Plandemic and his incredible team in order to live stream to the world this game-changing film. Can everyone watching now please share this link via the sidebar to any and all of your social media channels? Let me repeat that. Can everyone watching please share this link now via the sidebar to any and all of your social media channels? This is important. Simply ask your friends and family to give us 15 minutes and then they can decide. Your share could make a real difference to the outcome in these very challenging times. I make this pledge to you now that none of Plandemic, Indoctrination, or anything else we stream will be edited, censored, removed, or banned. And that anybody in the world can watch the full version free at freedomplatform.tv forward slash movie. On a personal note, these past few months have been some of the most challenging of my entire life. My reputation has been questioned in the press, my business is under threat, and my basic human right to express myself is being denied every single day. But this has also been the most empowering time of my life with millions of people from around the world rising up and voicing their support for our movement. As a result, I have never been so steadfast in my convictions to fight for these basic fundamental human rights to freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And that is why we are broadcasting here today. At London Real, we have been a platform for free speech since 2011, and I am excited to exclusively live stream the world premiere of Plandemic Indoctrination right now. Before we start, please share this link via the sidebar to all of your social media accounts. Your single post could make the difference in our battle against the tyranny of censorship. Thank you and enjoy the film.
On behalf of our center and our partners, the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our audience here in New York, as well as our larger virtual audience participating online today. The Event 201 scenario is fictional. Today's scenario is going to simulate meetings of a multi-stakeholder group called the Pandemic Emergency Board. We're at the start of what's looking like it will be a severe pandemic. And there are problems emerging that can only be solved by global business and governments working together. There has been uh, some conspiracy theories that are around about uh, the potential that pharmaceutical companies or the UN have released this for their own benefit. And maybe this is a time for us to showcase some cases where we are able to, to bring forward some bad actors and leave it before the courts to decide whether they have actually spread some fake news. A new coronavirus. Infected people got a respiratory illness with symptoms ranging from mild flu-like signs to severe pneumonia. In related news, a significant demand for personal protective equipment like N95 masks and gloves are on the rise. Patients are overwhelming healthcare facilities. People are avoiding public spaces out of fear of infection and in compliance with public health recommendations. Our US affiliate has just released polling results on public expectations for a vaccine. And 65% of those polled are eager to take the vaccine, even if it's experimental. I'm not optimistic about having the vaccine in time to be relevant during this pandemic. With enough money and political will, anything is possible. Penalties have been put in place for spreading harmful falsehoods, including arrests. If the solution means controlling and reducing access to information, I think it's the right choice. What exactly are the risks and benefits of staying home from work? Absolutely, we need to save lives, but we literally cannot afford a heavy-handed response that suffocates our economy. The world saw large-scale protests and in some places riots. This led to violent crackdowns in some countries and even martial law. The public lost trust in their respective administration. Economists say the economic turmoil caused by such a pandemic will last for years. The societal impacts the loss of faith in government, the distrust of news, and the breakdown of social cohesion could last even longer. We have to ask, did this need to be so bad? On May 4th, 2020, as part of a documentary series called Plandemic, I released an interview featuring science whistleblower, Dr. Judy Mikovits. The interview received fierce backlash for spreading what the media declared dangerous conspiracy theories. As a father and a veteran media producer, there is no way that I would release harmful information into the world during a moment as vulnerable as now. I had known Dr. Judy for two years before filming her interview. I read her book, then thoroughly researched and vetted her story. After interviewing her legal team, former colleagues, and people who have known her for decades, one thing I can say without question is, Judy Michaelvitz is one of the most honest, caring, and courageous women I've ever known. Why then would the most powerful forces of big tech, politics, media, and medicine go to such extreme measures to silence her voice all over the world? And why did all of the debunkers invest so much ink and airtime defaming Dr. Judy's character while avoiding very real revelations pertaining to patents, conflicts of interest, and the deadly corruption pervading our global health organizations. To get to the bottom of these questions, as well as many others, I've spent the last several weeks interviewing scholars from all over the world, among them top doctors, distinguished scientists, and Nobel laureates. I also sat down with Dr. Judy for a follow-up interview and to give her the opportunity to respond to critics. You can see that full interview on the Plandemic website. While you're there, make sure to dive down the rabbit hole where you'll find additional videos, documents, and scientific studies that support the claims and perspectives put forth in the Plandemic series. Here are a few highlights from my follow-up interview with Dr. Judy. What do you have to say to the people who have tried to minimize your involvement with HIV by stating that you were at the bottom of the totem pole 13th author of a 13-member group of scientists? <laughs> well, the 13th author is the senior author, so that means they're the most important authors.
why did you agree to retract your own XMRV paper? The paper was actually force retracted. I was actually being held in jail. You told me that you had financial offers to remain silent. If you simply say you made a mistake and promise never to say another word, you can keep everything. You'll get all of your grants. You'll get everything back, millions of dollars. You'll get publication and funding. My lawyer said, that's the best offer you're going to get. I said, you don't understand me. I don't need an offer. I've already lost everything. If I thought even one child or one grandma was injured or killed because I didn't do something, that would have ended my life as I know it. There was no money you could ever pay me to get me to cover this up. I will never stop telling the truth. I'm the developer of linguistic genomics, which was the first platform on which you could determine the intent of communication rather than the literal artifact of communication. But we've also used that technology for a number of other applications in defense and intelligence and finance. And most notably, in the early 2000s, my company was responsible for bringing down what was at the time one of the largest tax frauds in US history. We maintained a series of inquiries into every individual, every organization, and every company that is involved in anything that either blurs the line of biological and chemical weapons or crosses that line in any of 168 countries. In 1999, there were a million patents digitized by IBM. And those million patents were the first time human innovation had been put into an electronic digital searchable format. We took that information and we did a very simple exercise using our linguistic genomics technology. Where I made the horrific assessment that approximately one third of all patents filed in the United States were functional forgeries. Meaning that while they had linguistic variations, they actually covered the same subject matter. In 1999, patents on coronavirus started showing up. And thus began the rabbit trail. March 2003, panic grips Hong Kong as a deadly new virus sweeps through the city. In 2003, the Center for Disease Control saw the possibility of a gold strike. And that was the coronavirus outbreak that happened in Asia. They saw that a virus they knew could be easily manipulated was something that was very valuable. And in 2003, they sought to patent it. And they made sure that they controlled the proprietary rights to the disease, to the virus, and to its detection, and all of the measurement of it. We know that Anthony Fauci, that Ralph Barrick, that the Center for Disease Control, and the laundry list of people who wanted to take credit for inventing coronavirus, were at the hub of this story. From 2003 to 2018, they controlled 100% of the cash flow that built the empire around the industrial complex of coronavirus. The World Health Organization has officially named the, the new novel coronavirus, coronavirus the novel sweeping coronavirus the country. Coronavirus outbreak. Coronavirus outbreak. The World Health Organization has declared the coronavirus, the coronavirus, has declared pandemic. An coronavirus international a public pandemic. health emergency. While we know that the coronavirus manipulation started with Dr. Ralph Barrick in 1999. The major characteristics of SARS, MERS, and SARS coronavirus too, it's a good way for you Ralph Barrick is the researcher at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, who's famous for his chimeric coronavirus research. In 2002, there was a recognition that the coronavirus was seen as an exploitable mechanism for both good and ill. On April the 25th, 2003, the U.S. Center for Disease Control filed a patent on the coronavirus transmitted to humans. Under 35 U.S. Code Section 101, nature is prohibited from being patented. Either SARS coronavirus was manufactured, therefore making a patent on it legal, or it was natural therefore making a patent on it illegal. If it was manufactured, 
It was a violation of biological and chemical weapons, treaties, and laws. If it was natural, filing a patent on it was illegal. In either outcome, both are illegal. In the spring of 2007, the CDC filed a petition with the Patent Office to keep their application confidential and private. They actually filed patents on not only the virus, but they also filed patents on its detection and a kit to measure it. Because of that CDC patent, they had the ability to control who was authorized and who was not authorized to make independent inquiries into coronavirus. You cannot look at the virus, you cannot measure it, you cannot develop a test kit for it. And by ultimately receiving the patents that constrained anyone from using it, they had the means, they had the motive, and most of all, they had the monetary gain from turning coronavirus from a pathogen to profit. Developing and owning a coronavirus vaccine has become a biotech arms race with political overtones. This vaccine gold rush is starting to bother me. Gold rush? Hmm, let's keep that in mind. And so somewhere between 2012 and 2013, something happened. The federal funding for research that was feeding into places like Harvard, Emory, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, that funding suddenly became impaired by something that happened at the NIH, where the NIH got this little tiny moment of clarity and said, I think something we're doing is wrong. And in 2013, the NIH said, gain of function research on coronavirus should be suspended. The National Institutes of Health had a moral and social and potentially legal reason to object to research. But the letters that were sent to the researchers essentially said, you are receiving notice that we're telling you to stop. And now on the bottom of the page, we're gonna clarify what stop means. Keep going. But when the heat gets hot in 2014 and 15, what do you do? You offshore the research. You fund the Wuhan Institute of Virology to do the stuff that sounds like it's getting a little edgy with respect to its morality and legality. But do you do it straightway? No. You run the money through a series of cover organizations to make it look like you're funding a U.S. operation, which then subcontracts with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The U.S. could say, China did it. China could say, the U.S. did it. And the cool thing is, both of them are almost telling the truth. Where did the coronavirus come from? There is a new investigation into its origins. U.S. intelligence officials tell NBC News that they are examining whether the virus accidentally came from a Chinese lab. Chinese officials pushing back against that claim on Thursday, tweeting that it might be the U.S. Army who brought the epidemic to Wuhan. I was the first person in the world to look at an epidemic and study its characteristics and prove that it was due to biological warfare and was not a natural occurrence. So I published that 28 years ago. Early in this pandemic, I did not think the coronavirus was a natural occurrence from bats. I feel quite convinced that this was a laboratory designed organism. There have been hundreds and hundreds of leaks from high containment laboratories that do research on pathogenic coronaviruses and other potentially lethal organisms. I was particularly interested in a paper that came out in Nature Medicine by five scientists claiming and it was definitely a natural occurrence rather than a lab construct. But the arguments they used did not hold water. They didn't really make a lot of scientific sense. And yet all kinds of very important people started parroting what this paper said. And so that, of course, got me scratching my head saying, why are these people risking their reputation when it's obviously illogical, you know, doesn't hold water? Somebody must have made them publish this and Somebody must have told these other people that they have to say it's, it's a great piece of science. You were quoted as saying, it was a meticulous job done professionally. 
It could be done by some, somebody very expert in molecular biology, I think. Et c'est pas naturel, c'est ce que vous voulez dire Non, ce n'est pas naturel, c'était un travail de professionnel, un travail de, de biologiste moléculaire. C'est un travail très minutieux, on peut dire, d'horloger, on peut dire, dans au quel niveau but des séquences. Mais dans quel Alors, but la, la, Dans quel but, ça, ça n'est pas, pas clair. Moi, je, je l'expose, si vous voulez. Mon, mon travail, c'est d'exposer les faits, c'est tout. See, the problem with all of this is the evidence is right in front of our face. And when confronted with evidence, we are told fact checkers are somehow transcendent. The pace of our modern world makes it nearly impossible for working people to research the events and policies that shape their lives. When seeking answers to life's most pressing questions, where do we go first? Google. Enter the subject, hit go, and there it is only what they want us to see. In today's culture of copy and paste journalism, it's common for hundreds of unrelated outlets to feature the exact same report. This is not the result of laziness. This is by design. When we see identical headlines across seemingly unrelated platforms, the logical mind concludes, well then, it must be true. The illusion that numerous news sources have arrived at the same conclusion gives us confidence to share the chosen narrative. And just like that, we become the unwitting pushers of propaganda. Search engines are the holy grail for those seeking to control the narrative. Google is already more powerful in terms of its control over people's lives than almost every government on the planet. As the most influential search engine in the world, through its ubiquitous reach, Google has more power to influence US elections than any foreign nation. You testified before this committee. You said in subsequent elections, Google and Facebook and Twitter and big text manipulation could manipulate as many as 15 million votes in a subsequent election? And the methods that they're using are invisible. They're subliminal. They're more powerful than most any effects I've ever seen in the behavioral sciences. And I've been in the behavioral sciences for almost 40 years. The blacklists is something that Google said didn't exist. And they testified that under oath. And nothing but the truth will help you guys. I do. Now me as an engineer, I just did a search on Google's internal search engine and guess what I found? It had blacklisted search terms like cancer cures. Why is Google deciding what people can and cannot search for? What was once an efficient tool for navigating the world of information is now a network for global surveillance, data collection, and social engineering. Now let's take a look at a few of the most commonly used fact checkers, beginning with Snopes. The husband and wife duo of David and Barbara Mickelson founded Snopes.com in 1995. They had no journalism background or training whatsoever. They built their fact checking empire by using Google as their primary verifying source. The Mickelsons divorced in 2015. Barbara sued David for embezzling money that he allegedly spent on prostitutes, as well as a lavish honeymoon with his new wife, who worked as an escort in Las Vegas before joining the Snopes cast of characters. In 2017, David Mickelson's new business partners filed a lawsuit, accusing Mickelson of multiple counts of fraud and embezzlement. Snopes proclaimed to be the internet's go-to source for discerning what is true and what is total nonsense. Yet one glance at their history of fact-free checking tells another story. When Dr. Mikovits claimed she was arrested without a warrant and jailed without a charge, Snopes rated her statement false. Had they bothered to explore the arrest documents, they would have seen that indeed there was neither a warrant nor signatures to officiate a charge, a fact that I confirmed with members of Dr. Mikovits' legal team. Was there a search warrant? No. And was she ever charged? No. Never charged with a crime. 100% correct. Judy has never been charged with any crime. Facebook's fact-checking arm, PolitiFact, is owned by the Pointer Institute, which has received substantial funding from big pharma allies such as Google and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Like Snopes, PolitiFact has a history of misleading the public. In late January of 2019, 
PolitiFact, Snopes, and FactCheck.org raced to squash the notion that coronavirus and its treatments were patented. They reviewed only three of the 4,452 publicly available patents, which unmistakably show that SARS coronavirus detection and treatment had been widely patented by both the public and private sectors. Facebook's founder pledged to the WHO, saying they would remove false claims and block exploitative ads. They're working with the World Health Organization and with the NHS, so they have a hotline, if you like, from those official sources. Wikipedia is the go-to destination for introductions to people, places, and things. Even the all-knowing Amazon Alexa calls on this digital encyclopedia. Alexa, who is Dr. Judy Mikovits? According to Wikipedia, Judy Ann Mikovits is a former American research scientist who is known for her discredited medical claims. She has been described as an anti-vaccination activist and a promoter of conspiracy theories, and has been accused of scientific misconduct. Wikipedia is supported by the Wikimedia Foundation, a nonprofit parent organization with a long history of politically tied funders. Many named, many anonymous. What exactly does a Wikipedia donor receive in exchange for their generosity? What began as an unbiased, open source platform is now weaponized to undermine the work and reputation of anyone deemed a threat to its stakeholders. And once they smear you, they lock you out for making corrections to your own bio. In summary, most independent fact checkers are neither independent nor factual. Simply put, they are political spin machines. And so what they have done is they've decided that there's an approved narrative. If it is in line with the CDC's public pronouncements, and if it's in line with the World Health Organization public pronouncements, it is presumed to be correct. I don't have to remind many Americans that the Center for Disease Control was the one that said you should use DDT in your homes. Used right, it is absolutely harmless to humans and animals. Remember the name, DDT. It spells certain death. A scientific panel today reported that pesticides may indeed represent a grave threat to mankind. Remember the swine flu scare of 1976? That was the year the U.S. government told us all that swine flu could turn out to be a killer, and Washington decided that every man, woman, and child in the nation should get a shot to prevent a nationwide outbreak, a pandemic. Well, 46 million of us obediently took the shot. Did anyone ever come to you and say, there's the possibility of neurological damage if you get into a mass immunization program? No. No one ever did? No. I can't believe that they would say that they did not know that there were neurological illnesses associated with influenza vaccination. That simply is not true. We did know that. Uh, and he's lying. I guess you would have to um, make that assumption. Then why does this report from your own agency list neurological complications as a possibility? You didn't feel it was necessary to tell the American people that information. Dr. Sensor's CDC also helped create the advertising to get the public to take the shot. The vaccines are safe, so roll up your sleeve. And now the Americans are claiming damages from Uncle Sam amounting to three and a half billion dollars. By far the greatest number of the claims, two thirds of them, are for neurological damage or even death. There are serious concerns tonight about how well the CDC controls dangerous germs at its own labs after yet another safety lapse. For the third time in a month, the CDC acknowledged deadly pathogens were handled incorrectly in government labs. That CDC is the CDC that allegedly is looking out for your public health. When we start with the assumption that the official dogma has to be the objective standard, then what fact checkers look for is a piece of published media that confirms the statement made by that particular organization and then debunkers and conspiracy theorists, blower-uppers come in and say, ah, we're gonna make this thing clearly the scam that it is. Every media outlet that is in the public media right now has planted evidence and they have re-ranked pages. So if you look today at face mask wearing, and if you look today at social distancing studies, you will see the studies that used to be number one, number two, number three on the pages of PageRank search don't exist anymore. And what is there 
are studies that wind up having headlines that support the common narrative. You're going to be hearing more about advanced guidelines. Because if you can keep people from assembling, guess what they're not talking about? They're not talking about the issues of the campaign. If you can keep people in their homes, the only source of information that you can have is what you curate for them. Now I know how to target my electorate. They are in the only place I allow them to be, being fed the only message I'm allowing them to hear through a media that I control. Since the invention of the printing press, there's been a battle to control disseminated information. In the early 1900s, oil tycoon John D. Rockefeller took control of every newspaper and news editor of his era. He became America's first billionaire, paving the way for the power hungry ever since. Thus began the gold rush for the modern world's most precious resource, the narrative. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal? During a Senate committee investigation, it was revealed that the CIA had been conducting a covert operation to infiltrate and control U.S. media. They called it Operation Mockingbird. We do have people who submit pieces to American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks? This, I think, gets into the kind of details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in executive session. Over 3,000 CIA contracted and trained operatives are placed in key positions within top media outlets. Posing as editors and journalists, these well-paid actors never dared to question the effect of their lies on the world beyond their cozy studio. How often does the CIA manipulate the media in this way? It goes beyond your wildest imagination. Setting up student organizations so they could draw radical students in, 5,000 university professors co-opted to help the CIA manipulate people's minds journalists in the U.S., including big-name journalists, co-opted to function routinely to help the CIA put out stories and biases to the world. As this 1952 CIA memo says, the aim is controlling an individual to the point where he will do our bidding against his will. It's a great brainwashing process to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. Would you say that continues today? Well, I, yeah, I would think probably for a reporter it would continue today, but because of all of the revelations, I think you've got to be much more careful about it. So how do we know that Operation Mockingbird still is in an effect? Well, we don't. It was the Telecommunications Act of 1996 that opened the door for predatory corporations to monopolize the industries of print and broadcast. This bill protects consumers against monopolies. It guarantees the diversity of voices. Today, a handful of corporate empires own and control the vast majority of everything you read, hear, and watch. From the biggest movie studios, television and radio networks, newspapers and magazines, to the vast universe of internet news and entertainment sites. Amazon has transformed its operations in response to COVID-19 to protect employees and keep packages flowing. The company is and keeping keep its employees flowing. safe and healthy while still delivering those packages to the company doorstep. The company is keeping its employees safe and healthy. The company is keeping its employees safe and healthy. Millions of Americans staying at home are relying on Amazon. Staying at home Amazon. And that is how it works. It's like a house of mirrors where you're seeing the same thing over and over and over again, except it's distorted. There's an industry that is paid to go after and target journalists, whistleblowers, and inundate our consciousness and the images we see to try to ruin, destroy, or smear the idea that they don't like or the person who's delivering it. You smear somebody with falsehoods and all the rest, and then you merchandise it. And then you write it, and they'll say, see, it's reported in the press. 
So they have that validation that the press reported the smear, and then it's called the wrap-up smear. Now I'm going to merchandise the press's report on the smear that we made. And it's, it's a tactic. Welcome back, everybody. News personalities are not the only high-paid actors to serve the propaganda machine. Most late-night talk shows are owned by the same corporate overlords and thus follow the same script, only laced with a laugh. Our main story tonight concerns conspiracy theories. Last week tonight with John Oliver featured a skit entitled Coronavirus Conspiracy Theories. It's like the claim that the moon landing was faked. First thing to note here is that Mr. Oliver opens with commentary about conspiracy theories that are completely unrelated to coronavirus. This is a standard tactic used by propagandists to set a tone so that anything that follows will be seen through the lens of absurdity. Plandemic, a pseudo documentary filled with a hodgepodge of conspiracy theories. Mr. Oliver then does his best to debunk Dr. Judy's claim that she was arrested but never charged with a crime. She was absolutely criminally charged. This was not an oversight, but a blatant lie. Prior to the taping of this episode, Mr. Oliver had the official arrest documents that clearly proved that Dr. Judy was never charged with a crime. Mr. Oliver then attempts to debunk the idea that a beach, aka nature, holds any value in boosting our body's natural immune system. Instead of challenging the point with science, he kills it with a smear. Everything that you just said is insane. Television is not the truth. We deal in illusions, man. None of it is true. But you people sit there day after day, night after night, all ages, colors, creeds. We're all you know. You're beginning to believe the illusions we're spinning here. You're beginning to think that the tube is reality and that your own lives are unreal. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion. So turn off your television sets. Turn them off now. Turn them off right now. Turn them off and leave them off. Turn them off right in the middle of the sentence I'm speaking to you now. Turn them off. In 1979, the world decided that we needed the Bayh-Dole Act because we needed to reform our patent system. And one of the modifications was we allowed recipients of federal funding to patent and retain economic interest in the research that the public paid for. You get a $5 million grant from the taxpayer, and then you get to charge the taxpayer a premium for the technology they paid to develop. Pfizer is going to get nearly $2 billion. Moderna receiving $438 million in taxpayer money. And yet both companies have said they will not sell the vaccine at cost. They're going to make a profit on it. Should pharmaceutical companies profit off this vaccine research that taxpayers have helped fund? And the Bayh-Dole Act failed the American people because rather than standing on the shoulders of giants, we now kneel at the feet of greed. My systems flagged anomalies when I started seeing nonprofits and corporates and cover financing for coronavirus programs in the late summer and fall of 2019. Our first red flag came out when we read the world at risk scenario. Now there is an organization called the Global Monitoring Preparedness Board. This organization is a part of the World Health Organization and this board includes Dr. Elias from the Gates Foundation and Anthony Fauci from NIAID. These two individuals, plus the director of the Center for Disease Control in China, come out with a recommendation that says that by September 2020, two global pandemic preparedness exercises have to be completed. And one of them has to be done on the release of a respiratory pathogen that then gave rise to an October event, Event 201, on behalf of our partners in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Event 201 took place five months before COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. The participants of the event are some of the same people that are now deeply involved in the real pandemic and profiting from it as well. Event 201 was a scripted, multi-camera, live event that was broadcast globally via the internet. An event of this complexity and magnitude would take months to write, prep, and produce. Placing the conception date 
at least one year prior to the actual pandemic. There is no question that there will be a surprise outbreak. Anthony Fauci knew as early as January of 2017 that we would see an outbreak before the end of 2020. Even Bill Gates, a man with no medical training, knew it was coming. If we start now, we can be ready for the next epidemic. Every single thing that you have seen play out in front of your eyes, all of them laid out in their tabletop exercise, which by the way, fact checkers have said, has nothing to do with the coronavirus outbreak. Just happenstance. This is that wonderful universe of improbabilities where events just co-emerge and then nature conveniently backs itself into our architecture. That's, that's the scenario we're supposed to accept. Brilliant. Some countries have banned travel from the worst affected areas. The president has made a decision to suspend all travel to the United Kingdom and Ireland. Dis and misinformation circulating over the internet. Across the world, misinformation about the virus is being shared online. A significant demand for N95 masks and gloves are on the rise. The demand for N95 masks to prevent the deadly airborne virus has surged. We could eventually have 52 million treatment courses per year but it will take many months to get there. We're still many months out from having something that we can really deploy to the public. And 65% of those polled are eager to take the vaccine, even if it's experimental. The new poll finds that 49% of Americans say they would get a COVID-19 vaccine should an effective one be discovered. I'm curious, who wrote the Event 201 script? If the visionaries of the event knew at least one year in advance what was needed, why didn't they take care of those things? Considering that Bill Gates has donated half of his fortune to make the world safer, why didn't he help to better prepare our hospitals and frontline workers? Why didn't any of the event's wealthy sponsors do something? Now here we are, you know, we, we didn't simulate this, we didn't practice. On behalf of our partners in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So both the health policies and economic policies we find ourselves in unchartered territory. Event 201 was not the first scripted exercise to prophesize the future with astonishing accuracy. Leaders of global health and business have been seeding reality with fictional scenarios for several decades. The scenario obviously is fictional. One year prior to Event 201, many of the same sponsors, hosts, and actors came together to produce a tabletop pandemic simulation for a fictional virus they branded Clade X. One year to produce a vaccine for this is too long. Uh, we should have stockpiled, we didn't, but we're gonna have to look at that vaccine question to see if we can speed up the delivery. And if we do not have the public with us, we're in big trouble. In 2010, the Rockefeller Foundation released a 54-page document called Scenarios for the Future of Technology and International Development. Page 18 features the pandemic scenario, Lockstep, a world of tighter top-down government control and authoritarian leadership with limited innovation and growing citizen pushback. China's government was not the only one that took extreme measures to protect its citizens from risk and exposure. During the pandemic, national leaders around the world flexed their authority and imposed airtight rules and restrictions from the mandatory wearing of face masks to body temperature checks at the entries to communal spaces like train stations and supermarkets. Even after the pandemic faded, this more authoritarian control and oversight of citizens and their activities stuck and even intensified. We are living in a time where leadership, unfortunately, is compromised. And by that, I mean, that individuals are placed in power for their ability to be influenced, not their merits of leadership. Nothing could be clearer than the leadership of the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization is the institution granted exclusive power to guide and protect the health and wellness of humanity. The WHO is sustained by private donations, the bulk of which are made by pharmaceutical and biotech corporations who have a vested financial interest in the organization's support. In 2017, the Associated Press reported that the WHO routinely spends about 200 million a year on travel expenses, more than what it spends to fight some of the biggest problems in public health, including AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. 
To continue watching the rest of the episode for free, visit our website, londonreal.tv, or click the link in the description below. Thank you.